Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Retro Spill Messen. Now, my name's Dan Wood. I'm Ravi Abbott. And we host a weekly retro gaming podcast from the UK, um, The Retro Hour, which you can see on the screen there, all the details. Um, you can get it from wherever you normally get your podcasts from or our website, theretrohour.com. Our show comes out every Friday, and uh, we cover the retro gaming news that's been happening in the last week. But then I think the main feature on our show is that we have a special guest on every week. Now, these are veterans of the video games industry that we talk to every week, the people behind the games and the companies that we grew up playing. And that's exactly what we're doing at Retro Spill Messing today. So we're going to be talking about, for the next hour, one of the most legendary British video game companies of all time, um, responsible for games like Donkey Kong Country, Killer Instinct, GoldenEye 007, Perfect Dark, Banjo-Kazooie. So please welcome David Doak, Chris Marlowe, Sean Pyle, David Wise, and Kevin Bayliss talking about Rare. Now, just as a brief introduction, I thought it might be quite nice, just really briefly, if we can start with you, David Wise, at the end. Uh, just kind of introduce yourself briefly and tell us a little bit about what you did at Rare. Hi. Uh, is the mic on? <laughs> Two, one, two. Yeah. I'll use this one. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, I make the tea. I used to make the tea at Rare. And... Uh, <laughs> No, no, seriously, I, I actually um, I was responsible um, for some of the music at Rare, so um, yeah, musician, sound design and that kind of stuff, and uh, that's what I do, and uh, this is Kev. Morning, everyone. Uh, I uh, clean the cars and wash the windows and did a washing up and drink the tea that Dave makes. <laughs> now, I uh, make graphics, animation, and now I actually work at Playtonic Games now doing the same thing as I did 30 years ago, but... Uh, just with the same old boys that I worked with at Rare at the time. So, I'll mess this up, I always do. So, uh, yeah, I'm Sean Pyle. Uh, so I was a senior software engineer, but as we really are, a programmer at Rare. So I started in 97, I think, or 96. Ni it was 96, thank you, Chris. Um, so, yeah, I just wrote the code um, that makes the games work. So uh, that's me. Hi, I'm David Doke. Um, I was initially at Rare a system manager, so I used to crawl around under all these guys' desks, banging my head and sticking leads in. <laughs> and then I moved on to Goldeneye, so I was designer and bit programmer on Goldeneye, and then uh, there for, for half of Perfect Dark. Um, my name is Chris Marlowe, senior software engineer at Rare for 23 years, non-stop now. Uh, working on games from Conker's Bad Fur Day all the way through Connect Sports and finally on to Sea of Thieves, which is the latest project I'm on. Well, Kevin and David, you were there in the kind of early days in the mid-80s. What was it like there working at the time? Uh, what was it like in the mid-80s? Uh, well, <laughs> Dave and me would come in in our shoulder pads and uh, <laughs> new romantic sort of style. <laughs> And costume and uh, yeah, it was a, it was very. There was a, there was only a few people at Rare at that point. I think when I began, there was about eight people at the company. And and Dave, I think you were uh, freelance. Yeah, I, I was freelance at, at that point. And you're right, it was just like the eighties. It was like something from Back to the Future. <laughs> so that'll give you an a idea. Really bad version of Back to the Future. Well, Chris, I know you um, from reading other interviews with you. You were a fan of Ultimate Play the Game, which was Rare's predecessor. Um, years before you worked at Rare, did you realise this was the same company when you went to work there? No, it was quite embarrassing, really. Yeah, so I, I was a massive fan of the uh, Ultimate. Uh, my first uh, console was a uh, ZX Spectrum, and uh, uh, you know I, I got it for Christmas. And the first four games I got were all Ultimate games, like Transam, Attic Attack, Jetpack. Uh, so I, I was fully instilled, and I, w I got every Ultimate game when they came out. Absolutely loved it. Uh, and then when I went to university and um, when I was looking for a job afterwards, I, I then just applied, I got a copy of Edge and then just went through every single advert at the back, just you know, just phoning up directory inquiries, getting the number of the company, uh, not even knowing it was in America or UK. I, I really managed to annoy the, uh, the, the directory inquiry uh, person because I got to know them quite well because I kept phoning it up and it was free uh, from a payphone. Back in the day, and then the, and the and yeah, I finally got uh, an interview, and I literally it wasn't until I turned up in the train station I went, 
I recognise this. <laughs> oh my god, this is like where I <laughs> one. It was uh, it was near where I lived, and I had no idea they they were based just down the road from me. And then um, and then when I got there, I was looking at uh, I was having my interview. I was sitting down ready to go and have my interview. I was looking around on all the walls. It's just every single game they've ever done. I was going. Oh my god, this is ultimate. Oh my god. And of course, when I went in, I said, oh yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan, big fan. Yeah, I've, I've loved everything. <laughs> you exactly what I was doing. <laughs> this is one that, you know, Kevin and uh, David Wise might be able to answer a bit more, because this was like, you know, the early days of Rare. I remember, we're talking about Ultimate Play, the game. They focused on the ZX Spectrum, which was a big home computer platform in Britain. But then Rare came along, and it was mainly the, you know, the consoles, like Nintendo, the NES, which at the time seemed like they were bigger in America than they were in the UK. Was there a reason that Rare focused on the Nintendo rather than the home computers? Uh, I think the, the Tim and Chris have thought that they'd taken it pretty much as far as it, the the video game industry was going to go with those 8-bit machines, the 64 and the uh, Spectrum. I think that there were new machines coming in, but the, the market was very different in the UK to how it was in the Nintendo. And the Nintendo, the NES had just been released and it was... It was actually being a really successful machine after a bit of a flop with the video game market in the, in the, in the States. And so I think they just saw an opportunity there and uh, they took a cartridge, I think, and backwards engineered the, the code from that cartridge and, and I think they put together RC Pro-Am and they showed that to the guys at Nintendo and uh, they were so impressed with it. They said, okay, you, okay you, you can write for our system. And so they, they built up a really great relationship with Nintendo from then on. And uh, yeah, I, I'd never heard of Nintendo at all. I, I was just 64 and ZX Spectrum all of the way. And when I saw it, I didn't know what the machine was, but I was just amazed by the... I thought the graphics were a lot better than what you got on the, con, on the home computers that we were using. I didn't like the sound so much because I loved the SID chip on the Commodore 64. I just loved the music. But uh, as, as a whole, the machine, it was a really solid machine. And uh, it was the first thing I'd got the opportunity to work on anyway, so I was happy to work on anything. So it was cool. Yeah, and obviously, with the although we didn't realise at the time, the, the NES had this huge potential over in America, which was why they were directing their efforts to reverse engineering the, the unit to break into that market. And as, as Kev said, they really that they'd asked for dev kits, but they they didn't have dev kits; it was totally in house. And, and as Kev said, they, they they took this cartridge, reverse engineered it, uh, rocked over to Nintendo to show them, and that, that's how they managed to break in. Fortunately, so it panned out quite nicely. Well, Rare was founded by Chris and Tim Stamper, and there's a lot of kind of brothers in the 80s video game scene, in it, in, especially with British games companies. And they were a bit of an enigma, and they kind of still are. They don't do many interviews. What, what were they like to work with? Hey, who's this answer? Who's going to answer this one? Any, any of you guys. Because we've all worked with them. You've all. Uh, yeah, well, Chris was the quiet one, and Tim was the angry one. It was, it was kind of the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> was a simple way. So Chris did uh, all the programming, and he was super quiet. And he would come in, you know, and uh, you discuss something. Yeah, mm, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Do you think we should do that? That sort of thing. Whereas Tim was all bluster and excitement, and this do is it, how this do should be again. done. Do it again. <laughs> do it again. <laughs> do it again. Yeah, exactly. that's wrong. Do it again. I hate it. Do it right. Yeah. Uh, I think because I'm when I sp I began. I'd had no guidance uh, how to make graphics, no um, previous experience, and so I was in an office with Tim on my own, so I got to work with him sort of hands-on, and we'd sit there with the radio on, and he'd come and say, you're doing the right thing, but you're going the right, wrong way about it, and so he would show me how he would do it, and he was very good at sort of putting you in the right direction, and he knew that you knew what what was required and but he would show you how to do it and he would show you he'd, he'd always do it better than you would which was a little bit annoying but um, you know he was, he was my mentor really so uh, a lot of respect for him and he's uh, a very good artist of course too because not only all of the artwork that appears in the video games he did all the um, the, the box art for uh, all of the ultimate games but it Around the studio, there's a lot of artwork, airbrushed artwork that Tim had done, put together on the walls and frames. And you'd look at them and say, oh, that's really good. That's like something you'd buy in a shop. It looks really good. And I'd say, oh, Tim did it. Just, everything's got Tim written at the bottom. So. <laughs> well, there's rumours about them like being workaholics and working 18-hour days, seven days a week through then? 
we, we all we all did to be fair um i think uh, it was just the way i mean when i got there i couldn't drive so i was stranded in the middle of the countryside and waiting for my lift home which was usually nine o'clock in the evening and uh, tim and chris's younger brother Stephen, would drive me home so, come on kevin you finished yet and he would take me home and then in the morning i'd be in there again about half past eight and then the same would happen again and then at the weekends I mean, people had moved down to the middle of the countryside to work at Rare, and they'd, they'd often moved away from their friends and family, so there wasn't a lot else to do other than work. And so, although you, you call it work, it, it wasn't really work. It was a bit of a family environment there. Even when it was a, a small company, even when it was a large company, we all had the same interest. And so, at the weekend, well, you, you can come in and, and play a bit of a game and, and create a game, have a bit of food, and it just that was your weekend. It was a slightly different pace to what it would be at the week, but it, it never really felt like work. So There was also a lot of car washing as well, as I remember, on Saturday mornings. Best, best place they, to get your car They had the clean. best car wash thing machine it, it, long before anybody else did, and it could really uh, clean your car. So that was always a good incentive to go in at the weekend because... Car got clean. I'm sure it wasn't purposely designed, honestly, but the, the way that when we were in the old farmhouse, there was just one road, there was one lane that you went up to, and then the main car park. So obviously, the, that, that got filled up completely, and also parking all the way down to almost the road. So if you wanted to leave at five o'clock and your car was at the other end of the car park, you'd have to ask. 40 people to move their cars to get out of the way so invariably yeah. you'd be afraid to do that because it yeah. looked like you wanted to go home first yeah 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 but I, you want I to move just, the car? why do you want to move the car i was just going to say about the stampers um because again like chris at ultimate when i found out it was rare i found out before and it was like that's where i'm gonna go and i was still at university and then i applied and and to me my recollection of tim and chris is i, I was sat doing some work and chris stamper came in and i thought it's chris stamper oh my god you know, and he sat on my desk and just goes, oh, how's it going, Sean? You know, what are you working on? And it's like, I've got to explain to Chris Stamper what I'm doing, you know, as a coder, which was, was just totally intimidating. But, I mean, he was a great guy, and Tim was just really enthusiastic about what you were doing, um, you know. And he, he was kind of the artistic side of the brothers, um, and it, they, were, they were just good to work for. My... my Favourite memories of Rare are, are the sort of the Stamper era, definitely. Um, once it was Microsoft, it became a bit more, you know, you didn't know who was running stuff, so. I just want to say one thing about them. Um, they were so enthusiastic about games, you know, and, it, 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 you know, was, I, I remember when I, was, when I was leaving, they were kind of like, it's like well, you, why, 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 you, why do you want to leave? You know, this, this, this place we have here is completely made to do what you want to do. Um, and another thing that became clear to me when I ran Free Radical was how much they protected us from all of the other forces that, you know, because it, it famously games get schedules get messed around, budgets get messed around, things get cancelled and stuff. And, and at Rare, they really fought the corner for the teams. Do, do you think part of that being out in the countryside, uh, the isolation helped the focus and kind of everybody feeling like camaraderie with a project and yeah i mean it was very much a, it's a little community i mean you know looking back on it there are things which were bad i mean you know we we worked excessively long hours you know but it was born out of passion i mean we've spoken about crunch and things yeah. you know like you know we, we catch up and stuff and the thing about all of that stuff is that certainly at rare um it's actually quite addictive once you start doing it. And when you're working with people who you trust on small teams, you, know, you see other people doing stuff, and it's, it's almost like magical things happen. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really it's a, it's a, it's a hard problem, that, because some of, the, you know, some of the things that made our games great were just the amount of time and, 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 and being there nearly all the time to make them. Um, it's, um, it, you know, I, I don't think there's an answer to that yet because when you see something that's really, really good, it often means that people have put excessive amounts of their life into it. You know, so. Also, when we say we're out in the country, we are out in the middle of nowhere. Absolutely no. There is no going out at lunch and nipping out to the post office. It's, it doesn't happen. There is nothing for miles. It's, there's a zoo. Yeah, we can go to the zoo. Can I, can I just like say, um, another thing I just remembered... And we talked about this other day. I knew I'd remember something. It was one of the interesting things about working at Rare. 
uh, particularly working hands-on with Tim, it wasn't. It didn't just stop with the uh, video games because he was such a creative guy. And we were having a talk and a laugh about it the other day. He'd got designs on uh, a hi-fi system, uh, motorcycles. Uh, he had. It was into Shire horses, and so he had his own stamp of Shire horses thing going on. He was a, a great carpenter. He made a lot of the furniture at, at Rare, and so he was a really creative guy. And uh, at one point, we were talking about it the other night, there was um, an arcade board that Chris put, scaled down into a tiny handheld sort of video game console, and we called it the Playboy. And it was, <laughs> it was a fantastic machine, and we had the whole arcade running on it in full color on the, what was called the RAS board. And we had, it was um, Plock running, wasn't it, by Pickford Brothers. Uh, was running on there, and it would look fantastic. The problem was, it was the size of an 80s mobile phone. You know, these great big ones that you, you it was about this size? <laughs> and um, so you'd hold it, and you'd turn it on. It's like, look, oh, it looks amazing. Oh, battery's dead. And it, it, that was the problem with it. And it was bright red, and it was a great looking little machine, but there was always something like that going on as well. And so, as well as the games, Tim would always have something else on his desk going on. So, oh, yeah, I think we're going to do this. We're going to do this. Uh, board game, you know, lots of things like that that was always going on in the background. They also have quite an interesting way of, of running the company, as in, uh, I've never known it in any other place where, so um, certainly when we were back in the farm, uh, they actually had barns. They were literal barns of, of a farm. There's a farmhouse and barns that were all converted. And the, we were split up into four or five teams. But every single team was run like a separate company, as in, they were all top secret to each other, and they, there was no encouragement to like talk or, or, or cross feed information or share tech because they had a they, their, their their feeling was if we all share ideas and look at each other, the games are all going to end up being samey. So, you know, we'll end up just doing similar games. So we will be if we keep everything independent, there, there's going to be there's going to be drive, there's going to be competition. So it was. Um, it was a really interesting way of doing it. I mean, it didn't help, so we couldn't share tech. But there was, we re reinvented the wheel an awful lot at Rare over and over again. But it did mean that each product was very unique. And there was quite a bit of rivalry to get the, the best product out, which kind of was a motivational thing. Well, in those formative years, I mean, it was a lot of licensed games at first. I know, Kevin, you were working on stuff like, you know, Beetlejuice and, and Nightmare on Elm Street and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. I mean, was it a case then of just trying to get the company established and just pump out a load of games, as many as you could? Yeah, we, we were trying to grow the company. Well, Tim and Chris were trying to grow the company. We were, we were employing a lot of people to work on... I think we did some of the micropros, uh, the pirates and um, uh, silent service and a lot, a lot of licensed games that people at were new to the company, they had a conversion ready and set to work on. And so before you knew it, we had about 20 titles going and, and the company was sort of doubling in size every sort of six months. So it grew quite a rate. And, and then, as you say, we, we talked about it yesterday, we, we decided we wanted our own uh, identity. And so that's when we came up with the Battletoads and we sort of left all of the licensed material then. But... It was, it was nice because you knew where you were with all the licensed stuff. It's like, this is Beetlejuice, this is Roger Rabbit, I know what I'm doing with this. It was really exciting to get all of the, the scripts. The, when we, I remember we got the script for Goldeneye, didn't we? And it was sitting there and, and straight away Tim was writing back to them. I think this watch is a great idea that you've got in the film, but it would be great if it's a Game Boy. And it's a the typical kind of thing that we'd do. But, um, yeah, it was, um, <clears throat> it was great to get all of that, that stuff from the licensed projects. And... Um, to be able to then work on it, I and mean, Goldeneye came about 10 years after the film anyway, but it didn't matter, it was a good game. Well, uh, yesterday we did a panel on Battletoads, and in, I think it was 1993, basically three were released uh, in that year alone. So was that a really important franchise for Rare? Battletoads, was it? Um, yeah, I mean, how many different titles were there now? We've got the, the Game Boy version, the Super NES version, we've got the arcade version, we've got the original NES version, so it, it, it worked, what, everything we wanted to do. There was a little bit of merchandise, there were some uh, toys made, like Battletoads Bendems, I think. They're quite, quite, that's what they're called. And I look at those on eBay now, and they go for about $100 each, because they were quite rare. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's, it, I think it was successful. And they said a reboot now too, of course, which is great, so. 
Let's talk about Donkey Kong Country. I mean, that was a huge game on the Super Nintendo. Um, over 8 million copies sold worldwide. And we were talking about, you know, yesterday when we did a panel on that, those kind of, it seemed like a next-gen game. So I remember the adverts, were, you know, it's not 64-bit, it's not 32-bit. And you use that really impressive technique of doing pre-rendered 3D graphics. So that was called advanced computer modeling. Explain a bit about what that was and what, where that idea came from. Advanced computer modeling. <laughs> we had a lot of these acronyms, didn't we? Um, <laughs> Were there any more? Rare Dynamic Animation. Yeah. That was the next one. RDA. Um, what was the process involved? Um, whereas before, we'd draw the character on paper and we'd pixelate it, and then we moved on from pixelating it and decoding it to having an actual editor, which was like um, using, I guess, a very, very primitive version of Photoshop. Um, it was all 2D. We, we invested in the 3D... Uh, software which was called Power Animator at the time. It's now it's evolved since then, and it's now called Maya or Maya. And um, <clears throat> so you'd build a wireframe model, and the computer would generate uh, it, it, it'd transfer all of these curves into tiny, tiny triangles, and and the light would hit all of the squares and triangles, and it'd create a, a solid shape. And we point a camera at it, and the camera then makes a rendered image of uh, a 3D ape or a 3D collection of shapes to resemble an ape. We move them around, and as soon as the light was hitting it and, it, and the shadows would appear, it looked very solid. And so, those were then 2D images, which we would have a, an alpha channel, so there was a mask around it, and it, it became a sprite. And so we just lay those sprites, played them as animation. And basically, you'd got a, a small film show of everything that you were making in 3D. And it, it did. It looked like it, it was actually real-time rendering. But, it, of course, it wasn't. It was all sprites. I mean, this was one of the incredible things that uh, Chris and Tim, they, they made a real leap of faith. And they invested heavily, not only in the new, the latest software, but also the latest hardware, all the indies and things, that the all the SGI machines, silicon graphics that... Um, these machines were hugely expensive and they were quite rare. And literally the only place that had more uh, of these machines was Pixar, which were doing a little thing called Toy Story at the time. So whilst they were developing Toy Story, we were doing the, um, the this, this same rendering technique uh, and turning it into video games. And uh, one quite funny story is that uh, at one point the Ministry of Defense had to contact Rare to say, why do you have all these, these basically supercomputers all sitting... What is that you're in, building in your in Basically like a, a bunker, <laughs> a secret lair in the middle of the countryside. Are you planning to try and take over a third world country? And it was going, no, we're actually making video games. And that, it's, it's interesting that, because I, I was, at the time, I was uh, doing post-grad, so I, I was doing science research, um, and my field was molecular modeling. So the, in, the, in the lab where I worked, I used silicon graphics to look at molecular models. And, and, and then as part of my job, I, I looked after the other silicon graphics machines around in, 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 in the building. So in this quite well-funded, it was Oxford Center for Molecular Sciences, internationally recognized, funded, you know, cutting edge research institute. Um, I think we had about, uh, over the whole site, there was, that I was responsible for. There were probably about, I don't know, half a dozen, eight SG machines. And they were the, and they were the fairly cheap ones. So the cheap ones came in at about 20, 25,000 pounds each. Um, and I went to Rare to look after, so like, yeah, that's right, and the software. So the, a, a license for Maya was like 6K a year, or what was Power Animator at the time, wasn't it? Yeah. I remember you running around chasing a ball on CDs, installing it on everybody's yeah. machines. Yeah, yeah, I see, yeah. So, so, but when I went to Rare, and I got the job at Rare because I knew how to look after silicon graphics machines. Um, and when I turned up, kind of day one, it's like, well, you know, how many are there to look after? So, well, basically, all the artists have one. So there's like, I don't know, there's probably about, I don't know, like 30 or something around the place. And we've got, we've got those big ones, the ones that look like big blue fridges that cost like, you know, two million or something. We've got a couple of those. And we've got, and we've got these other ones. And they had amazing names like Death yeah, Star. Yesterday I mentioned the Death Star yesterday. The Death Star, yeah, the Death Star, Death Star. And then there was Jabba and stuff. But it was great. I mean, it's like, so these guys had, like, you know, in, in, in research, in, in, in a top institution, they didn't have the money to buy these things, but Rare was just full of them, 
you know. Well, well, it impressed Nintendo so much that they kind of bought a 49% stake in the company. How much did that change things? And when Nintendo came to Rare, what was the reaction like? Was it was it kind of like we all have to behave now? <laughs> said Leo. Um, I don't. I think it really changed when Nintendo got involved at all. It was. Uh, they they invested and because they they liked what we were doing and they already had, had been working with us anyway for years and so we had a great relationship with them didn't change at all um, I think um, maybe we saw uh, saw a few more visits and uh, we got um, I can remember Ken Lobb came over and got heavily involved in Killer Instinct and some of the other guys uh, were sent over quite regularly and I think the this was a different area I, th I think we moved on from Usually it was somebody from Trade West or from LJN Toys or from Acclaim coming over to check on the licensed um, games that we were producing. But then it would just be Nintendo people coming to visit us because everything we were doing was just Nintendo then, wasn't it? So, But yeah, the, 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 the structure of the company was exactly the same and, and the working process was the same. Well, David Doak, you mentioned that you joined Rare in 1995, originally as a systems admin. So how did you go from doing sysadmin to working on GoldenEye? Well, I, when I started, I, I loved it at the start, but it was it was really strange. So, one of the things that was strange about my job was that I kind of had access all areas because I had to go to see people in the machines and stuff. So that was that was it was a peculiar role because only people who were kind of like management could do the same the same thing. So I could, I kind of saw a lot of what was going on, and and it was also great for getting to know lots of people. But I've been doing it for about three, four months, and I, it, it was just, it was becoming really strange because it was like, I think I say to people, it was like working at, in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, but you're the guy that replaces the fuses or something. <laughs> so you'd go around and you know, they'd be there with the exploding gobstoppers and stuff, and you're going, oh, that's, that's really cool. I said, what, what, oh, the, 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 the plugs come out of this, can you fix that? Um, and, and, and I was going to leave. It, 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 kind of, it was weird because I, I enjoyed being there and the people and stuff and things, but it was kind of like I can't be on the other side of the glass. So um, I, was, I was going to leave and, and, and some friends kind of faxed me a joke job application for something to, which came through to the office at Rare, which was something that you didn't normally do. And the idea of anyone there. So I was, it was immediately, Dave, can we have a word with you? Um, and I said, well, it's just I can't, you know, I think I, I, think I will leave. Um, you know, no offense, whatever. Um, and then Martin Hollis had said, well, don't, you know, well, other people said as well, but Martin said, no, he can come on GoldenEye. He can probably help out doing something. I'm not sure what it is yet, but he can come and help Change out. the fuses. Change the fuses, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so then I was on GoldenEye um, and, and stayed for... Well, originally it was meant to be an on-rails shooter as well, wasn't it? And then it, it, did that change? Yeah, well, it, I mean, by the time I was involved, it was first-person movement and, and all the systems were in place. But... The initial design for GoldenEye was that it would be something like Virtua Cop. Um, so an on-rails character. And, and despite the fact that, obviously, the N64 didn't have a light gun, yeah, but, it was, but you're going to use the, you know, the, the thumbstick to move the reticule around and stuff. Um, and I think the, it, was, it, was, and it was presented at Shishinkai show, I think, as with this kind of like on-rails footage. But it, it, I think Martin was saying, it's like it, they did, did the whole thing, you know, spent, spent all of the time building the pipelines and getting everything to the game, get it all working. And then everyone's kind of having that sitting around going, well, is it fun? I thought, well, to be honest, it's not much fun. And I was like, well, yeah, well, then they decided to make it, make it um, you know, first person um, and, and, and have player control. But one, I think one of the really interesting things about it is, is that a lot of the stuff in GoldenEye, which was seen as being kind of moving stuff forward technically in terms of uh, uh, first person games, like the character reactions and people running for alarms and all that kind of stuff, a lot of that comes from the kind of set pieces that you get in Virtua Cop. So it was like, you know, translating that into a, so a lot of the AI work, I think, benefited because of the way that the development explored a different path, first of all. One of the most famous features about GoldenEye, I'm sure like anyone had an N64 back in the day remembers getting all the friends around with the four controllers and the, the split-screen multiplayer games well into the early hours of the morning. But that was actually a bit of an afterthought, wasn't it, the multiplayer? I think, I think it was always something that was wanted to be done. It was always on the wish list of things you could do. And obviously, you know, the... The N64, you know, it had the four controller ports, so it was obviously, you, you know, that, that was something that was going to be possible to have local local multiplayer. Um, and we used to play a lot of, um, you could play Doom on the SGIs, so that was the thing that we kind of would play a lot of. Um, and 
I think Martin did a, a, a... I'm not sure how complicit Tim and Chris were with it. I don't, I don't know if you know anything about how complicit they were that we were doing it. But, but it did seem that it was kind of done outside of the scope of what management were watching. Because we were, the, the game was late, as Kevin said, it was, it was supposed to have come out, you know, like a year before, or whatever. Um, but Duncan, Duncan Botwood and Steve Ellis basically s- split off from the team and sat in a room and made multiplayer, and and we never really showed it to anyone senior until it was done, and it was like, oh well, is this? Um, I particularly remember Ken Lobb coming over. So Ken Lobb was the our big contact at Nintendo of America. And Ken Lott would come over and check up on things and stuff. And, and we'd always kind of hinted to him that maybe it was possible. Um, but it was like, you know, it's not going to happen because you're really, really late. I remember coming in. We said, Ken, we've got something to show you. And we walked in, and, and we had a, a, a dev kit up, but there were four controllers in front of it. And he said, oh, you guys, you guys, you guys. Um, and, 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 and the thing about the multiplayer for the team was that it, it became... Once the multiplayer was in, there was, at Rare, there was almost like this kind of like internal black market in GoldenEye ROMs. So, so Mark, Mark Edmonds used to send them out. Because you know, this weird thing where you know, we didn't look at others' games, but once people knew that there was a, a good multiplayer thing, it started getting sent around all the company. Was that where stuff like uh, you being inside the game as Dr. Doak or like Big Head Mode or stuff like that came from? Well, all of that stuff, all of the cheats and things were... Just you know, just trying what we could do, so that yeah, and, and then it, yeah, it's quite funny to make a Donkey Kong mode, obviously with a with a, with a big, big show and stuff. So, it, but everyone, everyone on the team, and a lot of other people at Rare, a lot of the kind of like other other staff as well, like um, you know, the technical staff and, and, and support staff are in in the game as heads. Um, the Doctor Dote thing came about because I had a character. I mean, because I was a scientist. My character was in the game. We had an objective with a scientist in it. And I kind of put it in just as a, well, it's got to have some name, put it in mine, thinking, well, this will get taken out for sure because it's just not something you do. Um, and sure enough, Tim said, okay, that's coming out. Yeah. Um, and, and we were naughty. Well, um, we, were, we were a bit kind of naughty schoolboyish as well. It was that kind of environment. It was a very institutionalized environment, you know. So, so when somebody told you to do something, you would kind of like, mm, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do it. But you know, under duress, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be bothered. Um, and I think, it, I think it was Martin who snuck it back in. So it got changed. So my name wasn't on it. And then as we were getting closer to deadline or getting closer to having a, 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 a submission candidate and whatever... Um, Martin, Martin put it back in again one day. Um, and I think as these guys were talking the other day. It's like when you get to that kind of lot check thing, that somebody's going to go and make a couple of hundred thousand first run cartridges. You don't want to be messing around late in the day with changes. Um, and I think when it got noticed again, and it was like, well, that's back in again. How'd that get back in? It has to come back out again. We're going, yeah, but it, we've done all the localization now. So, you know, it's going to have to go back out to localization. And it's like, yeah, we, we'll, we'll do it. It's like, okay, well, yeah, just leave it, leave it in. Yeah. So I think that's the story of how it happened. I mean, I, people ask me and I retell that story. But I think that's pretty, pretty much how it happened. I was going to say about the, the multiplayer thing. So Team Conquer, well, Bodge, as we were known, <coughs> we used to take drops of, of the ROM and play multiplayer. And we had one guy on the team who always played odd job. You know, it's the little ditty, and we were like, fucking right, you know, because it really kind of ruins it if at five o'clock till six was game time for us. So we're playing it, and it was just getting on our nerves. So I went to Martin Hollis, and I said, look, he's always picking odd job, you know, can we do something about it? And he sort of went, we'll make the hits bigger. So he got Mark Edmonds to make the hit box on odd job bigger. Then he took that ROM, and it was only one ROM, and he put it back onto the guy that always played him, his machine. So on his machine, he looked normal, the normal size. But on everybody else's, we all knew that he was bigger. <laughs> and it, and it, it was just that sort of background. You know, we would just change it, but we would secretly drop it onto the guy's machine. He didn't know what we'd changed and whatever. And, and that was what we used to do, you know, just get up to. But we knew these guys really well. You just run, went round and went, can, can we do something? We probably got them to change the fire rates and all sorts of stuff. But, I mean, within about 10 minutes of this happening, the first game, he's like, bloody hell, this is rubbish now. I'll, I'll get hit all the time, you know. And it was, I wonder why. It was an exciting day when we also discovered the command that would allow you to play any sound file on anybody's machine remotely. Yeah. 
So, so you can imagine what we got up to with that, where we'd suddenly go, oh, this got this command. And then someone would just be in the middle of a meeting or something important with Chris and Tim, and some, something incredibly rude would suddenly start coming out of the speakers, and you see the panic in their eyes as they're trying to, what the fuck, what the fuck is this? You, you could also change the volume, so you knew that they popped up the volume controller, and you could remotely do this with it, and they're trying to get it with the mouse, and you could hear them, fucking, fucking, fucking. <laughs> Well, obviously, being a second-party developer for Nintendo, I mean, you had access to the, the N64, the Ultra 64, as it was called, hardware. And that, you know, the system got delayed quite a bit. And I know, Kevin, you were working on Killer Instinct for the N64 at first. Did the delays of the Nintendo 64 hurt Rare, and did it cause you guys any headaches? Uh, well, I, we still had a game to, to produce. We, had to, we wanted to finish Killer Instinct. The other guys were still... Um, we, we, we branched the the teams off. We'd now started production of Donkey Kong Country, um, but there was still a small team that were working on Killer Instinct, and I think there was about seven of us all together on the team at one point, so there was a lot of graphics and a lot of um, motion capture to take, and so we were, we were really focused on that, so I don't think it affected. The, we, we still always planned to put it out on the console when it was going to be finalised and released, and um, obviously when KI came out on to the as KI Gold, it was cut back and it wasn't quite the same as what was out there in the arcade. Um, you had polygonal backgrounds in places and and, and layered sprites and, and down downscale sprites. But I think for me, I was just continuing to focus on to um, getting KI done and then work on to KI two as the next next arcade game. So. It, it didn't really affect my workflow. I, I don't think it affected the company. So, and we, we're all so busy. We, we're getting Donkey Kong out there. So, well, Rare were growing, you know, a lot of this time, and obviously they made more hirings. And Sean and uh, Chris, you came on board. Um, what were you working on initially then when you when you joined the company? So you guys were working together, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, I, I arrived <laughs> a few weeks before Sean. So I get to speak first. No. Yeah. <laughs> With the six weeks seniority. Uh, yeah, so when, when we first arrive, we get dumped up into a little room and uh, you, get, you get stuck in front of uh, your, your indie and you get given an instruction manual, two instruction manuals about this thick of going, uh, <laughs> going and that's the instruction manual, read that, go and do something with it and we'll come back. So you sit there going, oh my God. <laughs> it's like the, it's like baptism a, by fire. Yeah, it was, it was like a couple of yellow pages worth of, of instruction manual which you run through and you get your simple one triangle spinning around on the, the screen. Um, and then Sean came on. I was very glad because I got up to Sean's office and we have someone <laughs> to be going, oh, my God, this is... Going, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was, it was the same thing. You do two weeks in the incubator, which is like... The, it's the attic at, at the old farmhouse. And it's south-facing as well, so that you boil to death. And they've got these tiny little flies that plague you. So I just remember that bit and thinking, God, where have I come to? And you do your two weeks, and then somebody comes and has a look at what you've done. And if it's not rubbish, they go, OK. And you just get stuck on a team. So I just got stuck in an office with Chris, which was on the KI barn. But we, we, we didn't look at what the guys were doing, because we, they were in little cubicles with glass doors. And, and, and we were just afraid, weren't we? We just sat in there going, I wonder what they're doing. Can we have a yeah. look? Dare we ask? You know, so you've got the guys doing KI. And, and we were just given little jobs to do. Yeah, it was right at the end of KI Gold, so it was just about to come out, and so everyone's feverishly working and going, possibly don't want to <laughs> jump in and change anything at the moment. But and then, of make course, a barrel fall over. And then, of course, KI finished. Uh, we didn't do any real work on it ourselves. We just got to play it at the end. And then 12 Tales was, was the yeah, big thing, you know, because well, it we, was Mario. Well, obviously, do, we did a full panel yesterday about Conkers. Um, if, if you want to find out more about that, I'll put it out in our podcast next week. But tell us a story about 12 Tales and how did Conkers Bad Fur Day come out of that game then? Um, I suppose um, we, we'd played, we'd all been impressed by Mario 64, so we all knew we were going to have to do a game in that vein. Um, and so we started doing our usual thing of trying to reverse engineer everything that they'd done to figure out how it all worked. And, and we were going to make a sort of um, the rare equivalent of Mario 64, so just a platformer where you collected stuff. And um, what happened is Banjo came along, essentially, because we were struggling kind of with the design, not with the technical side of it. We, we had a very technical team of people. 
um, but the design side of it wasn't really coming anywhere. And um, Banjo turned up, and we would have been competing with ourselves. So you don't want two Mario-style platformers at once. So you can pick that. Yeah. So um, so when we we'd, we'd even gone to E3 with it, it was quite far in, in, into development. As, as Sean said, it was technically there, but it just wasn't quite cohesive as a as a as an overall product. And Banjo was just looking great. So we were sitting there going, right, and we all sat down and had a beer, and uh, <laughs> decided that maybe that we need to do something different. And, uh, and that's where Chris Siva came from being an artist who he had an idea, said, look, uh, give me a chance to be, be the designer on it. I've got a, a, a new take on what we can do with this. So we, um, so Chris went and uh, Tim said, right, go and do the first the first thing, give me an idea what it is. So we put together the uh, the wasp scene where, the, where you go and steal the beehive and you're bringing it back and you get chased by the wasps. And then the funny bone, we said, well, at the end, instead of just disappearing, why don't we get a, a machine gun to come out and shoot the wasps in, in, instead of, and, and that would be the big surprise at the end. Uh, and so we put that together, got the cutscene of the, the shooting. Tim came in and said he absolutely loved it. Uh, do more of that, and then two years later, he came back and went, "Oh my God, what yeah. did you do?" No, <laughs> it wasn't quite like that, but it was. The other, it, the other thing about that, though, is that was kind of do or die. So if Tim had come in and not thought it was the funniest thing he'd seen, I'm, we would have been canned at that point because we had to prove after the the rebrand of the game, we had to really prove, and we we didn't know it so much as a team, but I think the guys at the top on the team, the lead programmer Mark B and Chris Siva knew that if that didn't go well, we'd have, we'd have been shipped out onto other teams. So it was a real crunch moment, and fortunately we passed it, so. Well, when a load of developers kind of left to go to Ape Wonder uh, and develop for Sony, what was the atmosphere like at the time? Oh, well, that, that was really weird, because nobody left Rare. Up until that point, I'd been there for, for perhaps two years, I, I couldn't recall anybody leaving. It's like being in the firm. You, yeah, once you were in, you <laughs> you're were in. in. You're in. You, nobody leaves here. And um, in the box. yeah, in the box. yeah. And essentially, when that happened, I think it was a it was a big it was the first big sort of shock. We had we had a couple of major sort of groups leave, and that was the first one. And um, I mean, for a lot of us, it worked out quite well because. <coughs> There was a noticeable bump in your salary, <laughs> which was nice, and, and people seemed to take more interest in trying to keep you. So all of a sudden it was like, you're not going to leave. You know, I remember being asked by my lead programmer, you're not going to leave, are you? you know, no, no, you know, I'm in the firm. <laughs> I'm going to stay for life. But. Well, was it a shock when the Microsoft buyout happened then? Did, did you see that coming? Or? Which, who, who well, like? well I, I think we could see something needed to happen um we were getting into it we, we got into a little bit of a rut i think it was like the we we'd entered this weird phase where we were doing prototype after prototype after prototype and i don't think anyone really had that the idea nothing was quite coming through going yeah that's the thing that we want to do that's the that's the next big thing and we did so many prototypes i mean the, like about a year and a half i remember of just prototype after prototype prototype of, of and no real decision being made uh and it was going through a bit of difficult times, so we, there was like redundancies coming up and that sort of stuff. And I think we needed a cash injection to keep going because it was a super expensive building. You know, it, it's a really expensive place to run, and if the money's not coming in, you can't just keep doing that. Uh, and I, I also think that um, Chris and Tim were keen to that people had been working really for a, a long time at Rare. We had they, they'd given out share. Share, you know, shares inside the company, sort of internal shares, sort of thing, and they just wanted to give something back to the company, get a cash injection, get something back to the the, the people who'd, who'd put in a lot of time into the company. So all those things came together to to when they decided to um, to to offer the company up, and uh, and I think Microsoft with the, I mean, I, th I think ideally they want Nintendo to come in to to have done it, but I don't think they were. Um, I, th I imagine they were given first first refusal on it, but um, and I don't think they were keen to have it exactly how Chris and Tim wanted it. Uh, and then it was offered up to a few other companies, and in the end, Microsoft just gave us a, an offer they couldn't refuse. So uh, uh, and and they brought with them a, a lot of the stuff that that made a, a, a modern company 
because the company was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, but it was still being run, you know, just by people who'd started off with, from the bedrooms and, you know, they learned a lot as they'd gone along. But Microsoft brought a lot of stuff to the table of, of being able to manage a large company. And uh, although it, they'd never really managed a uh, gaming, so if they'd started Xbox to come in, but it, they, they were still fairly new to that. So there was a little bit of getting... <laughs> Getting, you know, working the two different systems together and making them gel. So it took a bit of time to get that working. And they, they uh, would admit just as much themselves, it was a, they, they were learning, you know, at, at the same time. Uh, but overall, I'm pretty sure Rare wouldn't be here today if Microsoft hadn't come in. So I think overall it was the right decision. To I have to say the bidding thing was a bit funny because there was, there was, was it EA, Activision and... Yeah, and, and Microsoft. Microsoft were kind of like hanging back to see what was going on. And um, EA dropped out for some reason. I, I, I can't remember why. And Activision kept bidding and Microsoft bidding. And Activision were in the lead. So it was like, yeah, it's going to be Activision. And then Microsoft come along and they went, right. <laughs> Open their pockets. Doom. And it was like so much more than Activision that Activision just went, oh, my God. And Microsoft won. So there was this, you know, they might have been going like, did, 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 and then it was like, whoop, we win. So um, that was Microsoft. Well, for the last 10 minutes or so, we're going to hand over to you guys. So if anyone's got any questions about um, working at Rail, life at Rail, your favorite games, just put your hand up and we'll run over with a microphone. Everyone down the front here. Hello, thank you for a wonderful panel. Uh, this one goes out to you, uh, David Doak. Uh, in GoldenEye 007, uh, I've noticed that pretty much everything explodes. The alarms explode, the computer monitor explodes, even the friggin' chairs explode. <laughs> what, uh, why did that happen? Is it uh, because explosions are awesome? No, explosions are awesome. <laughs> I've never been in a real one, but... <laughs> um, I think one of the things with GoldenEye was that we were very keen to expand what happened in FPSs. So generally, the environments were, were, were quite static. Um, so I, mean, we, I think we kind of had this rule of thumb with, um, for the graphics, which was a third went on the backgrounds, a third went on the characters, and a third went on the props. So the props being all the... You know, crates and barrels and, 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 and tables and stuff. Um, I, I don't think the intention was to make, initially, to make just everything that is made of Semtex, so it just goes up if you go and if you, if you, if you, if you go leave it near a radiator or something. Um, I think, I'll, we were talking about this, I think what happened is that Steve Ellis had put in the particle, so at that time in games, particle effects were not a very common thing. I mean, it, any game now is just like layers and layers of particles and fancy stuff like that. Um, and so it was kind of done, for, done from scratch on, on, on the N64. So all of those, we used to call them the cornflakes. Those, when, when, they, when, it, when something explodes, you get the kind of like spiraling sprites coming out, counter-rotating. Um, and then there's the, the fire render on, on the top of it. And I think what probably happened was that when we put it in, or would see put it in, it was on all props, so that everyone could just get a feel for it and what it was like. And then it was just, well, actually, it's quite fun that everything explodes. Because it, it also, I mean, a lot of these things, it's not, just the, it's not just the visual part of it. It actually changes the way the game plays. So, and, and also, Goldeneye has this thing where if something explodes, the kind of the explosions perpetuate through the world in a, in a very kind of stepwise fashion. So you can have something that'll go off you know, you know if that monitor's blown up there, and if you're standing here, it's going to come, or that scientist is going to get killed by the explosion moving down. So I think they, they, they got left in as that. And, and, and there was also, I mean, there was an aesthetic thing as well, which is, I mean, we loved all the John Woo films, and that was kind of like, particularly those gunfights in kind of like, there's the one with all the bird cages and stuff, and there's just stuff flying everywhere. So it was, you know, and a big part of it from a game design point of view is it's like, it's a consequential action response thing in, in the game world. Um, so, you know, it, it, it embodies the player because you know you're there and it's another thing to think about. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad it stayed the way it does because it's very distinctive. Um, yeah, and... Yeah. What I want to know is who did the motion capture for being shot in the ass? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that's... I mean, one of the, the great... Well, not unsung because he... You know, but, but Duncan, Duncan Bothood 
Botwood, who was the, 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 the other designer in Goldeneye. Duncan did all of that motion capture. And at Rare, there were two, two, two ways of doing it. Well, uh, I think at the time, it was got for killer. There was, a, there was a motion capture system called Flock, which was just, it was, it was, it was it, I think it had kind of like um, flex response things on all your joints and stuff, and, and, and mag magnetic, magnetic probes or something. So it had this enormous, I think there's a big umbilical cord going into your back, and then this array of stuff, and it was, it was got for killer, and then you just discovered you, you couldn't possibly capture any kind of fighting move with it because it was too slow. You, you were, and also, it was, um, there was that many wires <laughs> traveling up and down your body, and each, each limb would have a, um, a magnet in it which would rotate and pick up what, what your, your joint was doing with the X, Y, Z rotation, and so you put all that data onto the joints on your wireframe model and it was motion capturing and you were walking around in a spaghetti suit and it was very sweaty and very smelly but then you we, we upgraded to the camera system yeah so then it went from 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 that to visual stuff so with visual markers so like kind of like um, ping pong balls covered with highly reflective tape and stuff which is which is i mean now it's all gone on to photogrammetry and things now i mean now you can do motion capture um, i mean it's it's amazingly Different, but but Duncan endured all of that, I mean, and famously Brett Jones, who did who, who who did a lot of the animation and 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 worked with Duncan on it. Duncan would stand with his eyes closed and not know where he was going to get pushed over from. So so, that, so that's where you get a lot of these kind of reaction things and stuff. But I think they're the getting shot on the ass and jumping around is Duncan. Bob so it's a bit like that robot that gets kicked all the time. Is it? Yeah, like, that's yeah. right. It doesn't fight back. Yeah. <laughs> we have any more questions? One over there. Hello. Thank you for... I like your T-shirt. Thank you. <laughs> um, I had like a bunch of questions when I was driving here, so I had to pick one of them. Um, I think one thing that stands out for Air is their well, childish sense of humor <laughs> that they try to insert everywhere. So what's like your favorite thing that you wanted to include that got cut? Um, we did at one point have a Hitler mustache, which you could wear as the, the teddies. We had different hats you could put on. <laughs> so we had like a Himmler hat, had a little, a little Hitler mustache, and all these different ones, that, that didn't make it. I thought it was quite funny when we just saw it, but it was, that did not make it. <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, hello again. Um, I was uh, having, uh, wondering about like a question to David Weiss here. Um, like you made one of the most uh, memorable or uh, one of the most popular video game soundtracks of all time, and probably the best ones in my opinion. Uh, have you ever uh, like uh, been offered or considered to do like like uh, outside of video game industry like movie soundtracks as well, or been offered to do that as well? In yeah, um, th there's a few projects coming up in the future that might be outside of the video game world, but I can't talk about it. So uh, <coughs> I'd, I'd have to shoot you, but um, yes. There are a couple of um, opportunities and, and stuff that I've already done that you'll probably find out about. We have time for a couple more. Yes. Uh, put your hand up, we'll come over with a mic. Uh, sorry? Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, and also, um, I've nearly finished my album, and that will be available next year, hopefully. <laughs> so, um, is, that, is that your stamp album, though? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and, and Kevin's doing the graphics for it, so there'll, there'll be a combination of um, great artwork and um, hopefully some nice tunes as well, if I get my finger out. The one down here. Um, so, uh, yesterday you had a Conquerors panel, and I didn't really get the chance to ask uh, then, but... One question that has been stewing a bit is, if you guys were to make Conquer today, I mean, obviously, a lot of jokes would not fly today, but uh, what kind of references would you put in today? What kind of parodies, I, references? I can, I can answer some of this, because I, I work with the guy that would do it. So we often talk about 
how we're going to form a company and make this. No, uh, we've got our own little company. But um, so Game of Thrones is absolute. I mean, I can't imagine Chris would leave that alone. Um, 100 million percent. Um, I suppose Chris is just a massive film buff, so anything, anything decent that's been out. Oh, what's um, Mandy is his favourite film. Have you ever seen Mandy? It's like a kind of, it's like psychedelic horror film or something. But visually, it's just amazing. So I think he'd definitely make a section that was just that mad. Yeah. So uh, also, I think Breaking Bad would be oh. right oh. for it as well. Um, there was a little team we did um, a creative jam, and one of their projects they just tried setting Conquer up inside the, the yellow suit, you know, inside the, from the Fly episode and having a, a level set inside there. Worked brilliantly, actually. So, and I've got, yeah, get the feels for that. That, that, work, that works really well. Yeah, yeah. And we really, there was a TV series called The Terror, which was sort of about these ships out in the Antarctic. So anything to do with the thing, definitely. We, we always, I, I think Chris always regretted that he didn't get the thing in because we both think it's, you know, one of the best horror films ever made, you know, even though it's old and the effects are a bit, you know. But yeah, the, the remake, thing, yeah. 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 Oh, no, no, CG. No, not, no, 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 no. No, but the thing, the thing definitely. But but Game of Thrones, I mean, we could probably make a whole game on the Game of Thrones. But I mean, there were, there were some, uh, I've got some drawings, um, like Harry Potter style conquer. So conquering the Harry Potter with the zip. And it was like, I think at the time we mentioned it, you know, for Conquer 2, because it, it was just kicking off, and they were like, she's never going to let you near this. You know, the light, you wouldn't get the licence at all. Either. Particularly the way he was going to use it. Yeah. And then she's, she's not litigious at all. No, 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 she definitely let us just take the mickey out of Harry Potter. And also um, Lord of the Rings... We, we had some stuff, it was Beard Elf or something. It was like Beardy the Scarecrow, but dressed up as Gandalf with the beard and the hat. And, and there, was, there was a Hannibal Lecter one where we were going to have uh, Hannibal the Manual. And uh, he, yeah. he was just be like the manual. <laughs> I was like, in that chair with the mask on him. Yeah, but I mean, it, it would just be that sort of stuff. But yeah, that, that, I think that gives you some idea. It, it, we wouldn't be short of ideas, and Chris certainly wouldn't, so... We have time for one last question, if anyone wants it. One down the front here. Oh, sorry, there's one there already. Okay. So this is a question for all of you. And it's more about, like, what are your thoughts on speedrunning? And, uh, like, what do, you, what do you think about people who speed run, have speedrun your games? I love I love watching speedrunners. I think it's amazing what they do. The, the the tricks they come to, like I love the golden eye one where they look down all the time to increase the increase the frame rate, and even down to the point where they've worked out that if you run diagonally, you get a slightly faster movement, all that kind of stuff. The crazy stuff that gets done. I I, I think it's hugely talented. The things that the, the amount of hours they put into it. Uh, yeah, I'd watch the hell out of any speedrun of a rare wonder, game. I have to wonder, though, because I, I watched the one on the Mario, the, the original Mario thing, and it was like, it was insane. It was, they were counting pixels and clock cycles and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, well, part of me is going, go and write a game. Don't, don't waste your life doing this. But I, un I, I like the fact that somebody's... <laughs> Tell it as it is, Sean. Jesus yeah. Christ. No, 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 but what I mean is you look at it and you think, how many hours have you invested <laughs> in this thing? I mean... I know it's kind of an Olympic sport, but, you know, from a programmer point of view, I, I get it, and I go, oh, that's really clever. Oh, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, like I say, there's a little bit of me thinking, go, go and make a game. But it, adds, it adds another layer of gameplay <laughs> yeah. in itself, doesn't it? At Playtonic, it's something we've started considering when we, we're writing a new, new project. Is, is we look at how, how great some of these speedrunners are, and, and something. we need to look at this for the next game, and and put some elements in there that only the speedrunners are really going to appreciate. And so it's, it's, I didn't even know what a speedrunner was a couple of years ago. I just thought it was like a, I don't know. It's what, good to have animal one runs in across the desert or something. Sorry, it's good to have one in testing, though. You want one of those guys yeah. in testing because they're going to find some incredible bugs for you to fix. Well, it got, it got depressing in Conquer, wasn't it? <laughs> they said, oh, yeah, we managed to do the whole game in like two, two and a half hours or something. You go, oh, God, no. But what, what's the speedrun time for Rusty Pup then? Sure. I can't tell you because it's a secret. No, the speed run, uh, I don't know. It's Chris Seaver's got the speed run, but if you want to come and see it, I've, I've, I've not seen anybody in the wild do it in under 20 hours, so there's a challenge for you. Well, it's quite... The GoldenEye is interesting in particular because it, 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 it's got a very, very long existing speed running community. Um, I, mean, I, think, I think probably because the cheats were unlocked by a game timer it, and, and, and GoldenEye 
speed runs can be verified on the on the, on the, on, the, on the video um, of of the game. But um, I mean, I, I've spoken to a, a couple of them a few years ago. Um, just I was doing a talk on Goldmine, kind of quite had dug out some footage, and it is remarkable because we, as, as these guys were saying, it's like when we were when Goldmine was being tested, that was one of the things that testing would do. Would they, they would just try to run past the setup. So you set the game up, and people you get the bug would be back. So well, if you do this, you can you know, the, the, it'll, the level will be over in a minute or something. So we would consciously be trying to stop speed running type activity. We, we didn't call it speed running, but it was just like people just running past stuff. Um, and, and, but there are just things that, you know, uh, there's, there, there's, a, there's a bit in Gold Knight in the, um, in the frigate level where there's a part where you can see from, through these pipes from one part to another. And, and the hits were such that you could, you could sneak through if you went a particular way. And, and we fixed it multiple times during testing to make it impossible to get through. And, and the testers, you know, it was verified that you couldn't get through. So it was a, I think there was some focus on from the rare testers and the NOA testers, so some of the best testing guys in the industry. Um, and you just watch the speedrunners now, and they just run up to it, and they just go a particular way, and they, make, they kind of make sure they get shot. So you get shot, you get, there's an extra hit goes on to you, and if the frame rate's right, then you go through it. It's just like, it's just like, it's what, like watching somebody going up and just walking through an open door. And just going, okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, it's been incredible getting these inside stories from you know, such a legendary company. So thank you for joining us. Please give a big thank you to our panel. And we did do some panels yesterday with uh, Kevin and David Wise and also um, Sean and Chris about Conquer as well. If you want to check those out, they'll be on our podcast at theretrohour.com over the next few weeks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.